welcome to the panel on the global impact of 9-11, 10 years later. Uh, as uh, I can see, in part from the numbers in, in the audience, there's certainly something called 9-11 fatigue, uh, which has set in uh, across the city, which is uh, very understandable. It's not that everything that has to be said has been said, but that we've heard so much that it becomes sort of a, a din um, <clears throat> around the ears. Uh, and this, these last few weeks really have seen an unprecedented invocation uh, and commemoration, memorialization and remembrance of 9-11, um, especially here in New York. Uh, and uh, in New York, the movement between the scale of the personal and uh, recollect, personal recollection and trauma and more historical and analytical interpretation of the events is particularly fluid, moving up and down between those scales. I represent the uh, Global Studies program here at the New School. My name is Jonathan Bach, and uh, I'm a professor here at the university. And one of the <clears throat> hallmarks of the Global Studies program is to be able to move up and down across these scales between the personal and the global, between the historical and the uh, local. <clears throat> now, this has been on our minds, as I've just said, very recently because of the uh, commemoration and Edward Rothstein, who uh, was writing in the New York Times earlier last week, maybe some of you saw his article, about an exhibit at the New York Historical Society, complained that that exhibit exemplified a larger problem with all of the commemorations he saw last week, which was, I quote, the private details of grief still overwhelm any sense of public meaning, which is peculiar, he writes, given the scale of the event and its consequences. <clears throat> These events that he's criticizing prevent us, he fears, from daring to commemorate and comprehend rather than simply remember. Now, while our panel this, while our panel this evening is here precisely to talk as scholars about the consequences of the event, I have to somewhat disagree with Rothstein's take, or at least take it as a challenge. Because what makes discussing the implications of September 11th attacks here in New York and in, to a different degree in DC and Shanksville particularly poignant is the deep connection to the personal. Personal grief can be blind, but it more clearly than anything else connects the global to the local and reminds us that the personal grappling with grief and loss is intimately tied to political actions and abstract theories. One of the most difficult legacies of September 11th has been the various wars carried out in its name, especially the war in Iraq, but also the war in Afghanistan, now in its 10th year. Together, these wars have killed twice as many American soldiers than those who died on September 11th, the victims, over 100,000 Iraqi and over 15,000 Afghani dead, to use conservative figures. The mutual suffering that these abstract numbers belie more than anything, connect the local to the global. So when we talk about the global impact of 9-11, in every conceivable way, the attacks and the consequences were global, meaning that their consequences and their impact were felt not only locally in New York, but throughout the world. There are so many different ways we could even try to think about September 11th as a global event. One could try to gauge it simply through numbers. One could speak of the 90 countries to which the victims belonged, or of the 28 countries that participated in the attack on Afghanistan, or the further 21 that participated in the NATO-led International Security Assistance Force, <clears throat> or the 34 countries that constituted the post-invasion forces in Iraq, in addition to the very small coalition of the willing, um, especially the US, the UK, Australia, and Poland that were part of the invasion. Or you could look at it from a slightly different numbers point of view, the 48 countries from where prisoners in Guantanamo Bay come from. Or the 20 countries that allegedly served as black detention sites for the rendition, or the 11 countries that granted stopover permission to the rendition flights, or five further countries that cooperated in arrests and abductions. Or perhaps of the 23 countries since 2001 where over 20 people have died in terrorist attacks that are linked one way or another to the causes championed by the perpetrators of September 11th. 
or moving away from numbers. One could speak about geopolitical shifts that have ensued, including the relative windfall in some ways for Iran and Saudi Arabia in the Middle East, the increasingly perilous condition of Pakistan and with it most of Central and all of South Asia, the unknown impacts of the changed landscape post 9-11 on the recent and ongoing revolutions and violence in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Syria, Bahrain, Yemen, and beyond. <clears throat> China's increased role in the search for energy and influence, an increasing disconnect between the United States and Latin America, which is partially a result of the war on terror. Or, and I won't keep going on in this vein for too long, one could speak of the attacks as part of various global circulations, global symbolic, a global symbolic economy of desire, images, and information, a global political economy of finance, information, and mobility, or a global knowledge economy in which today, for example, six nonfiction books are published each week with the word terrorism in the title, and whole nation state bureaucracies have been redesigned to focus on terrorism <coughs> focused security. I could add to this list for a very long time, but I want to note one particular, one particular aspect at this juncture, which uh, as somebody who has been trained and teaches in the field of international relations and global politics, I think is particularly important and which perhaps some of our panelists will touch on. And this is the way in which 9-11 has added terrorism to the existing justifications for intervention in another country's internal affairs, extending a list which most notably includes acute human rights violations. This has had a very concrete impact both under Bush and Obama from preventive war in Iraq to rendition to assassination by drone or special units in Pakistan and elsewhere, and also on the form and function of international intervention from NATO's out of area operations to the recent ongoing intervention in Libya. Regardless of what you think of any of these specifics, whether you think that they are done justly or unjustly, we see shifts in the scope of intervention and its quasi-legal justifications. These shifts in these quasi-legal legal justifications simultaneously reinforce a particular understanding of the state and of state sovereignty while raising questions about what happens to the excess generated by these new justifications and practices. Our second speaker, Karen Ross, was very much involved in the legal justifications connected to the global impact of 9-11 as he was a British diplomat who served on the United Nations Security Council as the Bush administration pushed for war in Iraq. And he resigned after giving evidence in a British inquiry that directly contradicted the official British position on the justification for going to war. He subsequently founded the world's first nonprofit diplomatic advisory group known as Independent Diplomat and is in significant demand both personally and through Independent Diplomat from Kosovo to Western Sahara to South Sudan. He is a pro prolific writer, keen observer, and achieves the unusual combination of being able to act directly in world affairs while analyzing it carefully with heart and head. Karn is the author of the book, Independent Diplomat, Dispatches from an Unaccountable Elite, which you can find from Cornell University Press, and the forthcoming book, already published in England, I believe, called The Leaderless Revolution, that is as timely as could be in addressing why people in democracies feel a lack of the very agency that their system is supposed to enable. He has written widely for The Guardian and for global newspapers and for media. And after a week of um, talking about 9-11 um, and writing about it, uh, it makes me feel that um, the most appropriate way to respond to it um, is indeed without words. Um, but I guess talk we must. Uh, we have to try and make sense of it. And um, others have tried to make... Sure, of course. <laughs> it's certainly possible. Um, uh, others are going to try and, try and make sense of it for us, um, unless we try to make sense of it ourselves. Um, and I thought Jonathan's introduction at the beginning of the microcosmic to the macro, the individual to the global, was very helpful. Um, because certainly for me, it, it, it made that journey all too telescoped. It telescoped that journey in one day, uh, because uh, on the day it happened, um, I was head of the Middle East section in the British mission to the United Nations, dealing with um, 
the Middle East, um, and of course terrorism. And those of us who worked on, a, on terrorism knew immediately that it happened, that it could only be one group that did this. Um, and I remember saying with my colleagues that terrible day, um, and many times thereafter, how on earth did it come to this? Um, uh, what a mess we have made of it, a real profound sense of shame and guilt uh, that um, what we had done had been so disastrous. Um, and the events that followed 9-11 have led me to a radical reappraisal uh, of my own belief in government. I had joined uh, the British Foreign Office with a profound belief in the rational um, sense and goodwill of governments and their ability, above all, to order the world and create security and peace and to understand it and to arbitrate it. And 10 years later, I no longer believe that. And it's partly what has happened in these 10 years that has drawn me somewhat reluctantly to this belief, a uh, belief that governments are no longer capable of ordering the world. Um, because if we look at what happened um, in response to 9-11, where governments claimed the narrative came to New York City and told us what to make of it, what it was all about, quote unquote. It seemed to me that they made, in that depiction of what it was about, and in that architecture of their reaction, they made a category error. Um, they said, as they were required to say, as states, that it is, it is states that can order the world, it is states that can recreate an order that has been so profoundly uh, interrupted and upset by this terrible event. Uh, and in saying that, they seem to me to have got things entirely wrong because they were dealing with a stateless phenomenon, an idea, not a movement, uh, not certainly not an organization, one without funds and barely any, with barely any funds and barely any structure. And it seems to me that this lies at the heart of where things have gone so wrong over the last 10 years, this fundamental tension of which we see much in the 21st century of states trying to deal with stateless phenomena and failing. Because what did states do after 9-11? They looked to other states to deal with terrorism. They first of all invaded Afghanistan. Um, I delivered the letter to the UN claiming that invasion under the right of self-defense and uh, under Article 51 of the UN Charter. Um, they, of course, then invaded Iraq, even though that event had no Iraq, the Iraqi regime had no connection whatsoever with the 9-11 hijackers. I knew I worked on Iraq at the time. But they also, uh, and most perniciously, collaborated with other states to control terrorists. And that collaboration was made without regard to the values of those states, what kind of states they were. For me, one of the classic examples was that the US government allowed the Chinese to send interrogation officials to Guantanamo to interrogate Uyghurs, who are separatists uh, from China, uh, about their alleged quote-unquote terrorist um, backgrounds. So states were undiscriminating about what kinds of states they were. Just as long as they were states, it was states that would put order back on the world. And this led the US and its allies, uh, including my own country, to do some terrible things, to enter into alliances with ugly, repressive governments, to torture people, to contract out our torture um, in the most extraordinary and shocking way. Um, uh, but it didn't work. This was the other extraordinary thing about it. The state's attempts to, make, uh, to remake the order have failed. Ten years later, um, we find that terrorism is not defeated. Um, Al-Qaeda still exists as an idea. Uh, the head of the British Army, no less, has said that you cannot kill Al-Qaeda. You cannot end it. You cannot end an idea. Um, we have a threat that has metastasized across the world, where there are now affiliates of Al-Qaeda in almost every continent, where um, you don't even have to declare that allegiance. You just have to commit certain acts of violence with a certain goal in order to be part of that terrorist movement. There are now um, affiliates, uh, groupings, some without name, some with declared names in Africa, now sub-Saharan Africa, who were attacks uh, last year in Uganda, the Horn, 
the Maghreb, the Middle East, of course, the subcontinent, Asia, uh, Europe, and of course the US itself. Um, we seem to be in a war without end. Um, before 9-11, I don't recall that there was a permanent threat from Islamist terrorism. Now we seem to be in a situation where that pet threat is perpetual. There seems no prospect of it ending. Uh, this is an extraordinary situation and in my view, entirely unacceptable. Um, the other facet which is consistent with this theory of the state's response um, that has manifested itself over the last 10 years is that uh, the one growth industry in the US as elsewhere in the West has been the construction of a vast new security industry apparatus bureaucracy which shares features across several states. They are by, by and large completely obscure, untransparent, in some cases lawless, but in almost all cases completely unaccountable, even in so-called democracies. Um, but recent events have at last shown us the light to what would have been a better response and what would remain the better response for Western policy in dealing with terrorism. I speak, of course, of the Arab Spring, where the revolutionaries in Tunisia and Egypt, and indeed in Yemen and Bahrain and Syria, have not only declared their fervent desire for representation and for democracy, but also their rejection of Al-Qaeda's rhetoric as a way forward in the Middle East. It has been very striking that that rhetoric has found almost no place on the streets in Tahrir Square or elsewhere. Indeed, most of the, almost all of the demonstrators have been emphatic in their rejection of that discourse as a way forward. That tells us what should have been our policy towards the Middle East before 9-11, before the, before indeed after it, and indeed now. Uh, we should be, we should have been, and we should in the future, supporting these democratists, these desires of democracy across the Middle East. Um, today, I'm afraid, our support for them is highly partial, uh, fragmentary. Uh, we are still in alliance with some very unpleasant repressive governments. Um, in Saudi Arabia, for example, still remains the chief Western ally in the Middle East. Bahrain, uh, we have supported a, a repressive minority government. Uh, Morocco, a place where we sent um, individuals from Afghanistan to be tortured on uh, our command, uh, continues to be a repressive government guilty of extensive human rights abuse. We continue to have anti-terrorist cooperation with them. Most extraordinarily, until the revolution in Libya, we had close anti-terrorist cooperation with the Gaddafi regime. Uh, we found out about that uh, uh, cooperation not from the actions of our own representatives in Congress or Parliament, not from the press which discovered this, nor from the courts which held our agencies acting in our name accountable. We found out about it because the rebels overran the office of the head of Libyan intelligence, Musa Kusa, and discovered these extraordinary documents revealing, for instance, that British intelligence had collaborated in the rendition of a man to Gaddafi's jails, along with his family, I dare say, dare, dare say from Britain to um, Tripoli, where he was held for several years. That man today is head of the rebel council in Tripoli. Uh, could you have a neater illustration of the uh, utter uh, inverseness, the wrong way round in which we have got our policy towards the Middle East? Could you have a clearer illustration of what would be the right way round. Um, so that, I think, is all I would say about a way to think about what has happened since then. There are, of course, many other ways, but this is my world of international affairs. And um, it is uh, the result of merely having looked at it, going from belief to disbelief to reillusion in some other form of politics that no longer should we be looking necessarily to governments to resolve this for us, uh, because in my view, they cannot.
and as long as we look to them, they will persist in taking actions um, which reassert their authority and which will be wrong. Uh, that means we have to look to ourselves. Um, this is a um, unusual feeling. It is rather discomforting, perhaps, but perhaps also refreshing. Um, we need to engage ourselves. We should be supporting people across the Middle East. We should be doing whatever we can to remove succor for repressive governments and to demand that our governments um, cease their partnerships with them. Um, we should engage amongst ourselves within our own communities. These sound like banalities, but in fact, the, the fact that we have left the reaction in the hands of our governments, as I said, the night of 9-11, in a somewhat inchoate and emotional way, literally yards away from here where I met a friend for a drink, governments will return. I didn't entirely know what I meant that night, but return they did. And um, whether we allowed them to or not, it has been a failure, and we need to redress that failure through our own action. Thanks. Our third speaker, Ginny Lokanita, who is an assistant professor of political science at Drew University and has just published a work of serious theoretical and practical import directly related to the global impact of 9-11. How it impacts and how it affects the fundamental logic of constitutional democracies when they feel compelled to impose pain and suffering on others. Of course, this refers mostly to torture, also known as enhanced interrogation, an issue which <clears throat> uh, is no longer as present in the United States discussion and media as it was a few years ago. And as law professor David Cole reminds us in a recent article in the New York Review of Books, Failing to condemn such blatant wrongdoing in some official way leaves an open wound both for the victims and for the integrity of our system and implies that the tactics were neither lawless nor immoral. The rule of law may be tenacious when it is supported, but violations of it that go unaccounted for corrode its very foundation. Thus writes David Cole. What Ginny suggests, however, is that this very foundation is even more complex than David Cole seems to imply. Even more uncomfortable, perhaps, than David Cole's at calling of attention to the dangers of glossing over the Bush-era approach to torture is Genet's finding that democratic governance and the infliction of excess violence is historically and empirically more closely intertwined than one might imagine. Her book is called Transnational Torture, Law, State, and Violence in the United States and India, and was published this summer by New York University Press. Thank you, Jonathan, for inviting me and for organizing this. Um, so as we mark the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks and the frightening images of death and destruction, and some of it was reminded by um, Sarah's very powerful film, it's obviously a very sobering moment. And um, at this moment, you know, to try and then step back and to think about some of the more transformative things that took place is both difficult but necessary, right? And uh, what I just wanted to start off with is to think about two terms that have uh, come up in uh, many ways, um, which are highly also nebulous terms, right? So fear and terror, right? And um, our previous speaker just talked about how there seems to be this moment of an unending war on terror, even if the terminology may have changed, right? War on terrorism is what uh, is uh, known now. Uh, but at the same time, alongside, you know, the, the very powerful images of memory of what happened on that day, some other events that also took place in New York City right, also have to come to our mind, right? So for instance, um, you know, we could talk about many of the things that took place uh, immediately after 9-11. Uh, there were hate crimes that uh, followed soon after the attacks, particularly targeting Muslims, South Asians, and Arabs, many of them who were citizens and immigrants. Uh, there was the detention and deportation of many from these communities using minor immigration violations. Uh, there was surveillance of communities in their homes, in their mosques, 
uh, which continue even today. There have been stories coming out about NYPD and CIA working together uh, and FBI working together. Um, but today I just want to talk more about one of the more dramatic features that also happened post 9-11, right? This uh, so-called, the use and the so-called return of torture and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment and coercion. Uh, that's what uh, I'm going to uh, talk about. And uh, what I'll try and do is to give us uh, perhaps a framework of uh, how we should approach the problem of torture in liberal democracies. And I'll talk a little bit about India, but also uh, about mainly about the United States. And I'll speak uh, about three themes. Uh, the three themes that I want to focus on um, is uh, basically, number one, what I call the containment of torture. And I'm going to explain what I mean uh, in a short while. The second thing I want to talk about is the anatomy of torture, right? What, is, what defines the limits, right? Uh, limits of uh, this form of violence. And third, as I said, I'll suggest ways of reframing uh, the debate on torture in liberal democracy. So when incidents of torture happen, the first reaction in liberal democracies is to deny, right? You can constantly think about statements which come out, we don't do torture, that's against uh, the values of our country. Um, and when such a denial is no longer possible, right? So think about when the photographs of Abu Ghraib came out or there were n number of reports that came out. There's an attempt to contain the extent and complicity of the state officials, right? And in the context of the United States, the containment has happened in many ways. On one hand, the problem has been, uh, of torture has been declared to be a past event by President Obama, right? Something that uh, Jonathan uh, mentioned at the beginning, we, because he has no interest in prosecution of state officials involved in the authorization of torture. But more importantly, on the other hand, the containment was also in the form of punishing by the Bush administration of the few bad apples, right? So if you think about what happened in Abu Ghraib and who got punished, it was basically the lower level, uh, you know, the military uh, uh, police, military investigators, right? Charles Grainer, Lindy England, Sabrina Herman, whose images were also uh, famous all over the world, right? Lindy England with a leash around an Iraqi detainee, for instance. So containment, I suggest, occurs by claiming that acts of violence are restricted to its use by the untrained military that need to be reformed and supervised. So basically, it's a question of, OK, lack of training. You can easily address it, right? And what is incredible is that despite the fact that we've been talking about torture for a long time, most of the reports have actually never accepted that torture actually took place. So the terms that have been accepted is that, you know, in Abu Ghraib there were acts of uh, purposeless sadism, for instance, or um, as I'll tell you from the Guantanamo report, uh, this is a Schmidt committee report which came out in 2004, and this is how they, uh, you know, this is what they state. And I quote from the report, no evidence of torture or inhumane treatment was found at Guantanamo, right? And what is, uh, they do accept that in one instance there was degrading or, in, uh, or abusive treatment, but basically no inhuman treatment. So the question is, if you think about what has been coming out in terms of, um, you know, uh, media reports and official reports, right? On one hand, they mention methods like sleep deprivation, extremes of hot and cold, right? Use of military dogs playing of loud music, yelling, right? The FBI personnel who were there confirmed that they witnessed these and some of the reports actually, you know, are based on that. And yet they managed to say that it is not torture or inhuman and degrading treatment, right? And here I'm not even referring to the CIA dark sites where, of course, waterboarding and walling, where you would push a detainee against a wall, um, war, were other methods that were used, or putting them in a small box with insects, uh, knowing that they may be scared of the insects, and so on and so forth, right? And one of the ways of containment or denial was basically to say that 
these reports did not look into the legality of the methods, right? So they basically, um, they just saw whether they were approved or not, right? So that was one strategy of containment. The other thing that you see is, you know, again, this has come up, um, I, I think one of our speakers mentioned this earlier, and which is that basically, whenever there were methods being used, there were euphemisms being used, right? So harsh or enhanced interrogation techniques is something you constantly being, constantly say. Now, but how do these reports deal with it? Right? And if you look at these reports, you find that sleep deprivation, for instance, right, which has a lot of uh, cases around it, when it started becoming uh, controversial, the terms that started being used was sleep adjustment or frequent flyer, right? And the, the reason why I say this is because there's almost an attempt to sanitize, right? sanitize particular methods. Think about frequent flyer. I think that's a really good example. That's something we as consumers want to increase, right? Frequent flyer miles is something, you know, we all want uh, more, right? And when you superpose, right, that particular understanding to an uh, act of violence in a custodial situation, right, there is an attempt then to sanitize it, right? And basically, I think uh, one of the other ways that you could see it was when a presidential candidate like uh, you know, uh, Giuliani would say, well, I'm sleep deprived as a part of the presidential campaign, right? So you basically minimize the impact of a particular method, right, in order to um, indulge in a strategy of containment, which means that these techniques become less scrutinized, right? And I do want to say here that uh, basically I want to suggest that this containment is a very common strategy, right? And I'm going to bring in a clip from, um, you know, one of the films that perhaps uh, many of you might have watched. This is Slumdog Millionaire. Um, and I just want to start with a small clip, a short clip uh, from the beginning. And those of you who haven't uh, seen the film, um, basically the basic plot is that it's about a boy from the Mumbai slum who manages to win 20 million rupees in a game show. And so basically a true rag to riches story. Um, and this was a big hit in 2009. Right, um, and uh, basically, in, I'm going to show the first scene of the film. Yeah, you can go ahead and put it. As you saw in the first scene, basically, you know, I mean, there are a lot of themes going on, but what is very interesting is that um, apparently, you know, when the producers were making this film, uh, basically, uh, the Indian government uh, intervened and um, it, basically they didn't say that don't show torture. Basically, they said, okay, you know, in a previous version, apparently the officer was doing the torture and they basically said you cannot show any, you know, higher um, official, uh, you know, uh, doing the torture. Um, and uh, so basically the producers of the film uh, changed it, right? And, you know, that's very telling because to some extent, it's almost like an admission that, you know, torture is very routine in India, right? And if you see that, uh, you know, the rate, uh, the, there are very high rates of custodial deaths uh, in, in India. But again, it's an attempt to contain the discourse, right? So a similar thing is going on where, you know, it's an attempt to say that the, pol it, the problem is with the police, right? It's the untrained, ignorant, illiterate, um, you know, a uh, constable, right, who does the torture, even though in the film we see that he just, you know, the higher official just turns away, right, and so the complicity is there, but the actual actor is uh, something uh, that the Indian government wanted changed, right. So part of it um, then is to also try and take attention away from the fact that the that Indian government has not yet signed, well, it signed the UN Convention Against Torture but not ratified it, right? And basically the judiciary, right, the Supreme Court has had a lot of trouble dealing with custodial torture in general, right? So this containment then plays an important role to 
lead to less scrutiny on how exactly torture continues to be an issue in liberal democracies, right? So the other uh, issue that um, I want to uh, talk about is to think about what is the anatomy of torture, right? In other words, um, how do you define the limits of torture? And here, I, um, you know, what I want to do is to think about two things. One, why is it that in the uh, reports, for instance, you had, you know, uh, the reports basically concluding that there was no torture or inhuman or degrading treatment, right? But also, what is the popular imagination of torture, right? And um, here, let me give you uh, two examples, and then I'll show you a brief clip again. This will be a very short one. Uh, okay. <laughs> Jonathan saying, it's okay? All right. Uh, all right. That's, that's good. But let me first, you know, um, tell you two examples. One, if you watch the show 24, right? And where Jack Bauer, right, uh, Kiefer Sutherland, is trying to save, uh, you know, uh, the city, the nation, the world, right, from terrorism all, all the time, right? Uh, there in that show, there's both a justification of torture, but if you think about what does Jack Bauer do? Jack Bauer shoots people, chops off their hands, right, and basically, um, uses very physical forms of torture, right? The highest, um, you know, the most horrific instances that you can think about, uh, which involve blood, right? Which involve dis uh, dismemberment of a person, is what is seen as the popular imagination of torture. And just to tell you that this is not, um, um, you know, uh, an example only from um, say, uh, what um, Kiefer Sutherland, right, Jack Bauer did, is to remind us also of what Attorney General, former Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez once said during his nomination hearings. He said, obviously, things like cutting off fingers, to me, that sounds like torture, right? In other words, there's a, a sense in which, right, you see a very a fixed notion of, or very narrow notion of what torture means, right? And here I just want to show you one uh, short uh, clip um, of, um, oops, okay, from the film Siege, right? And um, can I just, yeah, okay. And this is basically, you know, um, Denzel Washington is, um, coming into, he's an FBI agent, and he's coming in to find out what happened to his, uh, his prisoner. And on one hand, of course, very powerfully, Denzel Washington, you know, gives, um, you know, um, the, what is called the anti-torture speech, right? But it's also very interesting when he starts doing it, right? He only starts doing it when they start contemplating shaking, right, or cutting, right, uh, waterboarding, right? So basically, the more physical methods the moment they start contemplating is when he starts thinking about, uh, you know, giving that speech, right? But if you think about many of the methods that have been used, right, it's something less than that, right? In other words, you know, um, some of the more controversial methods used in, at Guantanamo were what was called gender-based coercion, right? So the fact that here you have a female interrogator who's uh, questioning a naked Muslim detainee, right, is not seen as a problem enough to really get Denzel Washington to speak, right? And these methods such as these, which are non-physical or apparently le uh, less brutal in many ways, then seem to be made much more acceptable in the process, right? And the reason why I focus um, a little bit more on the popular representation is to also say that, look, you see the popular representation actually matching what happened in the reports, right? So the Guantanamo committees, for instance, said that only methods which, were, um, which led to grievous bodily harm, right, were serious abuse. 
So if you can't show serious uh, bodily uh, harm, then basically they will not be seen as abuse, right? Similarly, if you think about you know, the most uh, infamous of the torture memos, one of the problems was precisely that uh, the John Yu memo, for instance, only thought of torture when it affected right, uh, dismemberment of uh, body organs, right, uh, death, and so on and so forth. Only that was seen as torture, which made basically everything less than that, right, become much more acceptable, right? So you see the legal definitions, the official discourses, and the popular imagination to some extent coming in, right? Which is not to say that, you know, what the Bush administration did in those torture memos, right, was not, cannot be critiqued, right? In fact, it can very clearly be critiqued because the actual definitions of torture, right, as um, you know, whether it's the UN Convention or the US laws, do talk about physical and mental torture, right? They do talk about cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. Those laws could have been made applicable. But what the memos actually tried to do is what I call aggressive hyperlegality, right? So they're using the law, different provisions of law, but defining them so narrowly that the whole purpose of those laws are lost, right? So that instead of trying to protect one against torture, they actually allow for torture. And I'll just make one last point before uh, I stop, which is, so how do we then, as we move ahead, how do we frame this discussion on torture? One of the things that sometimes, you know, very easily becomes applicable as a framework is this notion of state of exception, right? In other words, no laws were applicable, Guantanamo was a legal limbo, right, and so on and so forth. And I think part of what my work tries to do is to suggest that, look, some of these problems pre-existed, right? In other words, there were major discussions in the Senate ratification of the UN Convention Against Torture on how exactly to define mental torture, right? that there were ways to basically narrow, and the Senate ratifications went on in the debates went on in the 90s, right? So some of those definitional problems predated this moment and therefore continue even today, right? And so we have to continue asking these questions about where are you drawing these lines between torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, and coercion, and what is acceptable, what is not. And one very um, interesting but very, um, you know, something that gives us pause, right, um, development in this context is the role of medical professionals. And I'll just mention that and stop there, right? So medical professionals played a very important role in trying to not just be there as a part of the interrogations, but they had a very particular purpose. Their purpose was to see how much level of an act of violence can be used until it would reach the threshold of torture, right? And the point is that if there is lack of clarity about the definitions of torture or cruel and inhuman degrading treatment, right, and you have doctors who are there basically to ensure that, and there's a question about how do you assess, right? Then there's a way in which this is going to be a big issue in times to come as well, right? And this has been a major debate within the American Psychological Association uh, about whether um, psychologists in particular should be a part of um, the, these interrogations or not. Right? So rather than then thinking of torture as an exception, what I want to suggest is that it is a problem of excess violence. Right? And the trouble that liberal democracies, law, and the state have right, in containing levels of violence and often in the process accommodating them. And that's something we have to keep in mind as we go ahead. Thank you. Our last speaker brings the arc of our discussion back to the ground near us, so to speak, that area that Mayor Bloomberg has asked us to stop calling ground zero, that produces 
a surfeit of meanings, emotions, and uses as it navigates its terrain as sacred site, as a site of retail, business, tourism, and both a large-scale memorial that just opened today to the public and a memorial museum, which will open next year. Unfortunately, our original speaker, Elizabeth Greenspan, who we had hoped would be able to join us tonight, was unable to come at very short notice due to medical reasons. It is our great fortune, however, that we are joined by Amy Sodaro. Amy is a visiting assistant professor of sociology at William Patterson University and a scholar of how memory is institutionalized and deployed specifically in the form of memorial museums and what this tells us about how societies remember their past and what they expect from their memorials. We take memorials for granted, but the memorial museum, like the one planned to open next year on the World Trade Center site, is part of what Amy calls a new cultural form of commemoration that emerged in the 20th century as a response to that century's unprecedented violence, and I'm afraid to say that's the violence has been continuing, and is now, this culture of commemoration is now a global phenomenon. Amy has written about memorial museums in the US, Rwanda, and Hungary, among other places. She served as a consultant to the International Center on Transitional Justices Memorials Project and is a senior program associate at the Transregional Center for Democratic Studies here at the New School. In the broader context of international commemorative trends and practices that are very prevalent today, um, memorialization of 9-11 I think highlights some of the most salient issues that are present around the world in attempts to remember and memorialize trauma. Um, and I think that the 9-11 memorial reflects an aesthetic that is very prevalent in memorialization of trauma today. Um, and the process itself, I think, marks a culmination of recent trends and best practices. But also because of its scale, cost, and visibility, it, um, I think, highlights the challenges present in all memorialization projects and may, in fact, mark um, a new era of commemoration. Um, so memorials, sort of traditionally, in the 19th and 20th century, were built by victors to remember great men and great deeds, and they were a celebration and affirmation of the nation state. Um, this began to change in the second half of the 20th century in response to the violence of World Wars I and II, the horrors of the Holocaust, decolonization, the civil rights and feminist movements, um, and the many other atrocities, genocides, and wars of the 20th century. And so what we see in the second half of the 20th century is the emergence of a new memorials paradigm. Um, and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is kind of widely considered to be one of the first that represents this new paradigm um, and really does exemplify many of the tropes and practices that are um, present in memorial efforts today. Um, so for example, today's memorials, unlike their 19th and early 20th century predecessors, tend to focus on more inclusive processes that bring individuals and communities into the process of remembering, so it's no longer um, the nation state or the government that's doing the remembering, but it's individuals um, and communities. Um, they emphasize dialogue and deliberation. They attempt to involve stakeholders. Um, they hold design competitions to make the process open and public. They remember victims rather than victors. Um, they use abstraction to express ambivalence and to critically engage with the past. Um, visitors are not told what to remember, but they're expected to interact with the memorial and to interpret the past and create their own memory. They emphasize loss and absence, um, and they provide a space for reflection about past and future. And you can, if any of you have been to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, um, you'll, you'll notice that it really does try to do all of these things. Um, and I'm just going to kind of walk you quickly through a few examples from around the world to kind of demonstrate how um, some of the most sort of innovated and um, prominent memorials today are using these aesthetic um, tropes and memorial practices. And then I'll bring you back to the 9-11 memorial and kind of walk you through that. Um, this is an example from Peru. Um, and this is a sort of lovely memorial um, to 
all of the victims of Peru's civil war. And you can see these stones, you can't see very well, but um, each stone has the name of an individual who was killed in the civil war. And I think this really kind of highlights how um, the victims become the center of remembering. Names and naming is really central to memorialization today. And remembering um, is no longer about the, victim, the victors or the great men who did great deeds, but it's about restoring humanity and um, individuality to the victims themselves. Um, this Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin, I think, is a great example of um, the use of abstraction to express ambivalence, um, to leave the memorial project open to interpretation. It forces interaction, both physical and emotional, from its visitors and viewers. So it doesn't really tell them what to remember, how it, um, it forces them to create their own memories. Um, the Jewish Museum in Berlin is um, sort of built around these architectural voids, and that's what they're called, voids. Um, and they, I think, really highlight this idea of remembering absence or um, sort of highlighting and emphasizing loss, whereas before it was much more about, about triumph and victory. Um, and this sort of loss, I think, really drives memorialization today. Um, and yet, lest the focus be too much on loss or too much on victimization, um, many of these memorials often also have an affirmation of life and are oriented toward the future and toward building a future of peace. And so you see these kinds of memorial tropes, um, like at the Jewish Museum in Berlin, the Garden of Stones, at the Museum of Jewish Heritage here in New York, um, the trees growing out of the stone. So from this um, sort of trauma and tragedy, life, life carries on. Um, they become spaces for peace, peaceful reflection, and they really sort of embrace this ethic of never again. Um, so that was a really sort of very quick brief overview of some of the prominent tropes in memorialization today. And um, just a quick look at the 9-11 memorial. Um, I think really exemplifies how it's drawn on decades of examples of these kinds of memorials um, and these best practices that have emerged in memorialization. And um, it really sort of follows this memorial paradigm of today, but I think it may um, potentially take it to another level. Um, for one thing, it's, uh, it held an extremely high profile, very large international design competition. Um, there were over 5,000 entries from 63 countries and 49 states. These are just four of the finalists that were um, selected. There was a jury of experts, um, some memorials experts like Maya Lin, who designed the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, or James Young, who's a scholar who writes um, prolifically about memorialization. There were stakeholders um, from the families and communities. There were important public figures. Um, so it was a really sort of important body of individuals to select the most appropriate um, memorials design. And there were very um, public hearings. There was a virtual exhibition of the um, various designs in the competition. Um, and all of this was really an effort to make the process itself inclusive and to put the process at the center of remembering 9-11. Um, um, the, as, as Jonathan mentioned, the memorial opened just today to the public, so I haven't had a chance to visit it yet, and probably nobody here has either. Um, but I'm sure that you've all seen many of the images, um, and we've all been following it now, really, for almost a decade as it's evolved. Um, but in the final memorial, you can see, um, for example, the centrality of um, the victims, not only in these parapets um, that surround the memorial fountains, and it lists all of the victims' names, um, but also the um, centrality of the families of the victims throughout the whole process, um, not only of creating the memorial, but also the redevelopment of um, the area formerly known as Ground Zero. Um, and if any of you know sort of about the time and effort that went into designing these parapets, into um, sort of selecting the font um, and the design of how the names were laid out and then the arrangement of the names, where they were placed, how, how the names would be arranged on these, I'm forgetting now how many, I think it's like 1,700 feet of um, parapets at the memorial. 
great effort went into um, sort of bringing the individual victims into the memorial um, and turning it into a space where they really are at the center of what is being remembered. Um, the entire memorial, I think, really follows this aesthetic of abstraction um, that, that does reflect some of our ambivalence about um, the event and mostly the senselessness of the loss of life. It's, not at all a celebration, it's all about mourning. Um, and because of the placement of the names on the parapet, um, it really has to be an interactive memorial. It's really necessary for visitors to, to seek out names, to um, touch these parapets and panels. Um, so in this way, it's really attempting to make visitors find their own meaning um, in memory of 9-11. And of course, just the um, sort of concept itself is all about absence. The original design was called Reflecting Absence. Um, in these footprints of the building where the water cascades over these waterfalls into a reflecting pool, it then drops into what is called a void, this sort of um, black hole where it disappears that represents the loss of September 11th. Um, so I think in, and I'm being really brief, but I think that's good because we're almost out of time. Um, in this just very brief overview, I think you can see um, many of the aesthetic and sort of conceptual elements um, and tropes of memorials, um, memorializing everything from the Holocaust to the Vietnam War to um, Civil War in Peru. Um, this memorial also follows a very similar set of best practices for memorializing trauma. Um, but I would also say, and I'll just kind of leave some questions possibly for discussion or just for you to think about um, when you leave here, um, because it is one of the most visible, expensive, um, and publicly and widely contested memorials in the world, um, in large part, of course, because of its location in downtown Manhattan. I think it really, um, the process and the memorial highlight some of the major challenges and questions raised by memorialization. Um, and let me just kind of run through these and um, put them out there. One, I think, is the question of timing. How soon after a trauma should a memorial be created? Some think this process was way too fast. Others um, thought that it you know, seemed extremely long. And, felt like they were waiting um, you know, for a lifetime for this memorial. Um, another question is how we can reconcile the many goals and purposes of memorializing and remembering September 11th. Um, how do we reconcile mourning the dead, remembering the events themselves, restoring humanity to the individuals, restoring the community, um, revitalizing this neighborhood? Um, it was also an event, as this whole panel, I think, has sought to um, highlight that an event that had personal, local, national, and international impact and implications, and how then can a memorial accommodate the many stakeholders? Um, how is it possible to create a memorial for the families that were personally touched, but that will also serve as a memorial to a nation that sees it as their tragedy, or to the um, 93 um, countries around the world who also lost people in the 9-11 attacks? Um, and then finally, um, how, how to remember 9-11 together with its um, very ambiguous and often troubling legacy that we've heard so much about. Um, and I will just say the museum is slated to open a year from now, September 11th, 2012. And I think in the museum, some of these sort of larger questions will be addressed. Um, but I think they, I think, they sort of go for the project and process of memorializing 9-11 as a whole. Um, so I will leave it there. Thank you very much, Amy. Maybe I'll invite the panelists to come join me up here, and that way we can field questions for about 15 minutes. Um, and already I see a number of hands. To what extent you feel that the emergence of very large global corporations affects what the policies are that they overwhelm governments and that they, even though everything they do, they do in legal terms is dependent upon uh, public guarantees, 
they are setting the policy and everything that's, that's going. And it's all a form of marketing, including the propaganda, obviously. And the second thing has to do with the issue that was raised, having to do with torture and the place of health professionals in it. And it's obviously, unfortunately, not a new thing, not unique to this situation. The, 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 the big example of the, being the Nazi doctors, but it's only one example on, on the planet. Um, and this whole thing of, I guess, people within medicine or science or the professions um, somehow turning the other way and said, oh, it's really not us. And, and the, this continuance of doing it, somebody else is doing it, we're unblemished. And, and, and that problem there. Maybe we'll take the second one right behind as well, and then we can people respond to that. Uh, my question is, can, can you envision a remedy or collective action to prevent human rights violations by nation states against their own citizens? We already have eloquent documents like the International Declaration of Human Rights, but it's to which most nation states have signed, but basically it's just a piece of paper. So is it possible to, to come up with some kind of enforcement action to prevent nation states, including members of the Security Council, from engaging in systemic torture and human rights violations against people living within their, their borders. Um, it's a terribly, I'll try and do the last question and maybe touch on something that was raised in the first question as well. It's a terribly difficult question to answer. Um, but there are indeed global standards on human rights and treating one's citizens properly. Um, I used to think that my country and yours were the guardians, uh, or at least the supporters of these standards, and I think we've done grave damage to those standards. I don't think, however, that the that standards are destroyed. I mean, they still exist. They are still there in the form of the Universal Declaration, the International Covenants on Human Rights, and various other human rights instruments, including the Convention Against Torture, which was mentioned earlier. And I do think that the for all the degradations of the last 10 years, the, uh, the progress over the last 50, 60 years has been positive in terms of these standards being understood, being embodied, um, and even being enforced uh, in certain cases. Uh, one of the great victims of what happened since 9-11 was the idea of responsibility to protect, which was a, a principle that all member states of the UN signed up to, which states that Basically, um, if governments uh, attack their own peoples, other states have, a, have the right to intervene to pre prevent them from doing that. Um, that principle, that, uh, that idea, um, has been gr grievously damaged by what the Allies have done since 9-11. And I think it's also problematic looking to states to, to police the actions of other states. And I think there's something very profound about your question which troubles, well, not troubles me, but will occupy me, which is, you know, the embodiment of these principles has to actually come in a more, a more living way. Uh, I worry that looking to courts and states to enforce them is, is always going to be imperfect, that somehow we've got to get companies, ourselves, institutions, our own groups to sign up to these um, standards uh, and ensure their enforcement. And to an extent, that's, there is signs of progress on that. You know, there are companies that are being held to account for the human rights records um, of their workers, the workers' rights. You know, there are campaigns to trace back the components of Apple iPads all the way back to certain factories in Shenzhen province and the way people are treated in them. So I think, you know, there is progress. And I, I would appeal to you and, and to others listening that actually the way forward is through us own, our own actions to embody and enforce these principles in our own, in our own microcosmic way. Um, as for the first question, um, I'm not sure I can answer the question about corporations, I don't really know, but I do know something about um, 
the professional irresponsibility that, that uh, I've thought of something relevant, but not the same as your question about diplomats and about the denizens of the state, those who represent the state. Um, there is a deep, deep problem in that group, which is that they are told to think that they are not morally responsible for what they do. Um, and very decent, reasonable people can do terrible things uh, if they feel that they have the permission of their state and are encouraged by their state to do them. And I don't necessarily mean only you know, waterboarding. I also mean sanctions on Iraq or um, engaging in unnecessary war. And that is a deep, deep problem in the nature of, of, of the state and the permissions, the moral permissions that it gives um, to its representatives. I'll just say uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, you know, about the role of medical professionals, and I think you're absolutely right. There's a long history, and the history has also resulted in many standards being imposed, right? So, um, you know, where medical professionals um, uh, have declarations that, uh, that basically they cannot participate in torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, right? But what is very interesting, and I think this is where it is a little different from the past, right? Which is that the way it is being framed is precisely that they will not participate in torture and cruel inhuman degrading treatment because they are there to ensure the safety and legality of the technique, right? Now, it's very interesting because when you say safety, safety of whom? Right? I mean, and you could say that they're talking about the safety of the detainee, but actually, to some extent, it's much more about the safety of the person who's doing the interrogation to make sure that he doesn't, he or she doesn't reach the level that would violate the torture statute. And this is very clearly written in the memos, right? That the medical professional can intervene when there is you know, physical or mental harm or distress that reaches a particular level. And in that sense, that because the purpose is defined differently, right, that there's almost like this tension within the American Psychological Association, right, which tries to still have a group. I mean, you know, uh, a lot of people have um, said that they should not participate. There have been court cases in that regard and so on and so forth. But at the same time, it's this framing of doing it for security and safety and you know, um, legality, which makes it a little different than, even while you are acknowledging that you will not participate in torture and cruel and human degrading treatment. So that what we are seeing now is almost like a bureaucratic working of law and medicine, right? I mean, almost like a juridico-medical apparatus, right, to some extent being formed, which is different to some extent in terms of how it is being legitimized today. There's that phrase, safety and legality, as if the fact if it's legal, therefore it's safe. Right. Is an interesting uh, mm -hmm. combination. Um, let's take the two here in the front. Yes, we can start with you, sir. Clearly, Afghanistan and Iraq didn't work. Um, and the world is no, we're no safer now than uh, before. So the question that we were asking ourselves um, was clearly um, there had to be a reaction, a governmental reaction to 9-11. Now, I mean, it didn't have to be violent necessarily, but somehow the government couldn't have just said, well, you know, we'll build the towers back up and it'll take us 10 years and then we'll go on. There had to be um, a reaction there, uh, that was clear. And just as we were discussing among ourselves, we were sort of wondering, like, well, what have we had gone to the Taliban who were ruling in Afghanistan and said, we'll build 5,000 schools? That's what we'll do because you uh, husband al-Qaeda and uh, allowed them to do this. I mean, it wouldn't have worked politically, of course, but, and of course, they wouldn't have allowed girls to go to school and, you know, there, but um, then just to sum that up, uh, it has been um, essentially um, 35 years since we left Vietnam and now, of course, we're um, 
you know, they're hardly a, a model country, but there's a certain amount of freedom and we have tremendous um, commercial relationships with them and they're not a threat to us and we're not a threat to them. And so um, one wonders if one has to wait decades or um, just do tiny steps that get you somewhere. But again, that wouldn't have been politically possible here. But I was just wondering what what you think the reaction should have been given that the reaction we took didn't work. Thank you. Um, thank you for everybody's presentations. They were really from vast number of um, perspectives. It was really insightful. Um, in terms of the discourse on terrorism specifically, I, I'm always very torn in terms of what I think the role of the state should be, um, which I always end up going thinking that it should be minimal. Um, but given, given the growing like extremist discourse, I think being reinforced by states and state actions, especially of late, like Western states and our aggression, and, um, and kind of the reinforcement of the social aspects of terrorist groups and their, and their locations and in the support that they give in the community. For example, I, I just came back from Beirut, um, being there over summer, and Hezbollah definitely gives back as a social movement to the people. They support them, they educate them, they give them money when, they, when it's needed. So these are people that need that support and their own state has failed them and that's why these groups are coming in. I wonder, being a new school student, somebody that is studying development and wants to be a practitioner in, in the Middle East, what role do you see development practitioners having as non-state actors in this discourse on extremism, on development, on you know, intercultural relations, West versus the rest, and, and how we're perceived there, and um, just what, what you think the role should or could be? Uh, I mean, well, these are profound and difficult questions. Um, um, uh, on the question of development professionals, perhaps first, um, one of the interesting things about studies of terrorists, and particularly Islamic fundamentalist terrorists, is they're not from necessarily poor, they're not poorly educated, they're often very well educated. Um, a man who tried to pull off a nail bombing of a nightclub in London in 04 or 05, I think it was, was born in Britain, um, trained as a national health doctor, had two degrees, I think, um, and in some ways he's typical of it. So clearly terrorism is not necessarily a function of economic development. Um, so you know, developing countries which suffer from lack of development is not necessarily going to be the answer. Um, personally, what I think the answer is is mass engagement. I don't see any other alternative to that. Um, uh, reducing the other to the familiar. Um, and that is a very personal thing. And you as a development professional through your visits to Lebanon and elsewhere are very much part of that. And I think it's in a sense the same answer I would offer to that. It sounds inadequate, doesn't it? I mean, surely we want somebody bombed. We want you know countries dealt with. We want something firm. It seems pathetic to offer mass engagement, uh, cosmopolitanism as an alternative to that. Um, but I must say I have been very moved by the recent um, reaction in Norway to the terrorist attack there, uh, let's call it what it was, um, where the reaction of Norwegians has not been to you know, clamp down on political debate, we will target extremists, blah, blah, blah but to reassert the values that they hold dear, that make them different from the man who perpetrated this terrible act. These are the values of uh, solid social solidarity, the extraordinary scenes of public mourning in Oslo after the attacks, uh, to reassert democracy, the rule of law. Um, these seem to me to be the qualities that distinguish us from those who commit lawless violence, who commit murder like in 9-11 or in the island off the coast of Norway. And it seems to me, in some not necessarily very articulate way, that the reassertion of those values, those distinguishing features, in that lies some of the answer of, that we, we are groping for. I just want to add one thing, which is 
I mean, indirectly comes from your question, but I mean, I think the Arab Spring and the images that came from there should also perhaps make us rethink how we, uh, you know, look at gender relations in, you know, no, the non-Western context, right? So, for instance, um, you know, oftentimes a lot of the wars are uh, justified in the name of saying that it would liberate you know, women. And, you know, you look at the images from the Arab Spring. I mean, they were out on the streets, right? There's a sense in which that should perhaps also make us all rethink some of what gets into the justificatory discourses of war. Um, you know, um, even if different contexts may have their own challenges, but it's important to recognize that all these societies have, uh, you know, um, a lot of resisting that goes on despite you know, all the difficult conditions uh, uh, as it goes on everywhere else, right? So, you know, to break away with um, some of these assumptions would also be something that we can take from, um, you know, the images from the Arab Spring. We have time for one last question, and then we're actually over time, but, sir. Thank you. Hi. Um, I from from this presentation, I sort of gathered uh, sort of two ideas that we're talking about. Um, ideas that have come from 9/11. One is how we remember, and two is how we've dealt with this kind of political action from a, a, a private source. And I guess I kind of wanted the four of you to sort of talk about maybe thinking of the the research and the work that you guys have done already how you see perhaps the memory of 9-11 changing in the next 10 years, or perhaps the next 100 years, or however it is you understand the, the effect of uh, the memorial, the effect of the event, the effect of the political climate post 9-11. Take the next 10 years, I think it's a little more manageable. Um, Anybody want to take a stab at that? When, having looked at memorials over various periods of time, does that give you any indication, or is it? Or are they all so sui generis that uh, it's too difficult to tell? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I haven't. Um, I really haven't done much research on the 9/11 memorial specifically. Um, and so I have a really hard time imagining um, 10 years from now what memory will be like and what sort of role the memorial will play in that. Um, and I would also say I think part of, part of that, part of why I haven't researched the memorial and part of why I do have a hard time imagining that is because um, I live here, I was here when it happened. It's a very, you know, it's a personal um, event for me as well as, um, you know, an academic interest. Um, I mean, memorials in general tend to fade into the landscape. I mean, that's what happens to memory. Um, people forget memorials have kind of fulfilled their function, I think, when they do disappear as triggers for memory of that particular event. Um, and some of these tropes that I've described that are present in memorials today, um, I think, are used so that memorials don't fade into the landscape, so that people um, don't don't forget about whatever event it is that um, that's being remembered, but I, I that's not saying what you know what the event itself will um, how that will live on in memory and what sort of the political um, like long lasting impact will be. So maybe I'll leave that for somebody else to think about. Sarah, do you have any thoughts on this? Um. Well, uh, yeah, I thought because I screened the movie and had a lot of discussions, I, I guess I've had some thoughts. I belong to the school that thinks it was too soon, and I think I, I didn't. I thought the the rush to create it was a lot about containing the phenomenon, and I think. Um, but one thing interesting in this connection, when I, right after I finished the movie, and the, which is for the first anniversary, and then I was. Um, I, I had the opportunity to talk with the man who was the head of the um, New York Council of the Arts, Theodore Berger, at that time. 
And he said that, that this was going to be a very interesting moment because it wasn't just the World Trade Center, but he saw us, the United States, on the verge of the collapse of a lot of institutions. And he w it, one of them he mentioned was, for example, the Catholic Church because the pedophile scandals. But that, so that the, the loss of confidence in many institutions was happening simultaneously with this. And I think that also goes to kind of what you're talking about, too. So I think it, it's such a larger phenomenon, not because, uh, uh, for a lot of reasons, not because, uh, I don't want to get into this thing like, oh, it happened in the United States, so therefore it's worse than if it happened somewhere else. That's not what I'm talking about, but that the kind of coincidence, it, it wasn't just the United States, it's just such a wrong thing, I don't want to get off and rant here, to say these were Americans who died, they or United Statesians who died. It, it wasn't, it was global citizens of the global community. And so, but, okay, so I'll stop. But, but I just think it's a, a larger thing, and I don't think we really understand. I mean, even, well, I was reading the Juan Cole post yesterday, and uh, he says, well, in a way, it's just so out of date. The Arab Spring has made completely out of date what happened 10 years ago. And, or you would know more about that, but I, I just think that, that what's happening is a little difficult to pin down right now. What, it, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 it's a very interesting answer with which um, you know, it's uncertainty I can only agree with. Um, but uh, I was thinking about it in political terms, and I, mean, I just spent the week in England um, where 9-11 is indelibly wrapped up with Bush and extraordinary rendition and anti-Americanism, frankly, um, which is very sad given that, you know, for people in New York it was about one thing, which is the suffering of individuals, uh, regardless of race or nationality. Um, but they were Americans. Um, Anyway, I thought in political terms, perhaps we'll look back on it, perhaps in 10 years' time, as, as actually a really major turning point in several ways that I was thinking about. One is the apogee of American power. The end of the 20th century, the US was the boss, um, where, you know, invade, took, took over Kosovo from the Serbs, uh, very dramatic military victories in the late 90s, a real sense of American invincibility that is clearly over. Um, and with it, actually, a sense of Western superiority. Clearly, there's been an acceleration of the shift of power from West to East, um, which the war on terror, through its vast costs, has, uh, has accelerated. There was a lovely vignette of this described to me the other day. Um, the Chinese um, have um, bought the rights to exploit the world's largest copper mine, which is in the middle of Afghanistan. Uh, it's the largest copper deposit in the world or something, something extraordinary. And the Chinese, there is a Chinese company, Chinese state company that is busy setting up the mine. It is guarded by American soldiers. The Chinese do not have any troops in Afghanistan. Um, uh, one might draw conclusions from that vignette. Um, and the third thing is really to, you know, underline what you've just said, Sarah, and, you know, the collapse in trust of institutions. Governments failed to sort this out for us. And I personally think they are failing to sort out many phenomena of the 21st century, which are a consequence of globalization, um, trans-border, trans um, borderless phenomena like climate change, terrorism, economic volatility. And I think 9-11 will be seen as one of these moments where that, that, um, that, that kind of vision of a world ordered by governments cracked. Well, I'll just take, uh, if you want to take a, um, a sweeping view, you could take the uh, perspective which you hear in some quarters that, of course, 9-11 um, is the end of the 20th century. It's the end of the Cold War. Uh, not because it's 2001, because 1989 is normally thought of as the end of the Cold War. But in many ways, uh, 10 years after 9-11, we start to understand what it means to have the end of the Cold War, which is, uh, which is um, the crisis within the institutions of the post-war era, the institutions of, of NATO, of collective security, of the European Union with the uh, Euro crisis uh, and, the, and the common European project, um, of the Bretton Woods institutions of the IMF and the World Bank. 
Um, and so to one possible answer to your question about 10 years now looking back, what would we think about this, is that maybe we would see it more of a marker of a sort of end of a particular um, uh, post-war order. Um, but of course, uh, it's impossible to look into the future and we may uh, 10 years from now not be having uh, panels about the global impact of 9-11 um, or it may have become such a, uh, such a designation. I was thinking about this just listening to all of the ways in which the radio and the television were talking about this past decade. And so I think it was WNYC would talk about decade 9-11. Um, and, uh, and I hadn't heard it, but I finally saw it on one, I think it was on a CNN site, you know, 9 11 generation, um, who are only 10 years old now, I suppose. I don't know what it depends when you would start that, that count. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, will help determine to what extent 9 11 then becomes a defining and determining factor in our consciousness or whether it becomes an event. Um, uh, that gets contextualized in a much larger framework. So um, I wish we could answer that, but we'll come back in 10 years and, and try to uh, look at it then. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you to all our panelists for coming out. Thank you to the audience for staying for the end. And good night. <laughs>